Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's Life Ministry. We're sharing the stories and insights of real people living out God's love for the people He's created. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Steph Nugebauer. Today's episode is part of an ongoing segment called The Floor is Yours, where we invite a special guest to join us, one who has a unique perspective and experience with life issues, and they essentially get to take the mic. Today's special guest is Dr. John Pless, who really is one of a select number of people to whom I attribute my love for life ministry. Dr. Pless wrote one of the most concise yet conclusive books on a Christian's approach to life issues called A Small Catechism on Human Life. And so today, he'll be reflecting on that work and discussing how our beloved small catechism from Martin Luther provides a very robust framework for Christian thought and action in regards to life issues. Dr. Pless, welcome. Would you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Uh, Thank you very much, Stephanie. I am uh, Dr. John Pless. I teach uh, pastoral theology, catechetics, and theological ethics at uh, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. I have uh, been on the faculty here since 2000, so coming up on 22 years. Uh, My first call was to serve as pastor of University Lutheran Chapel Campus Ministry of the Missouri Senate at University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. And I was ordained in 1983, served there from 83 to 2000, as I I said. And uh, because of my position on the faculty here, uh, I teach not only in the area of pastoral theology, but also catechetics and ethics. In fact, right now, this quarter, I teach catechetics class. That's a worst devoted to the study and teaching of Luther's small catechism every Tuesday and Thursday morning. And then in the afternoon, I teach a class in a theological ethics. And there's a great kind of uh, a fusion or overlap between those two topics. And that was really what prompted me to prepare a small catechism on human life. Hmm. Like I said, I got this book when it, when it first came out in 2006. And I was in high school uh, at that point, and it it truly was a read that propelled me into researching, studying the scriptures about life issues, and and really gave me uh, the the push to be interested in life ministry itself. So I I thank you for that, and I commend this book to every one listening, every every Christian who desires to learn how to love and serve neighbor, you know, as set forth by scripture and, and Luther's small catechism. Well, thank you very much. It's very gratifying to hear that uh, one of the kind of features sometimes of being a writer is you write articles or write books and uh, they go out uh, into the world and you're not sure what kind of impact or influence they're having. And so it's always, uh, you know, gratifying for me when I hear someone say, as you did, that this book was uh, influential and, and helpful for you as a confirmant and uh, <laughs> really confirmed young person. And that kind of got me thinking as you were talking about the origin of the book itself. I did not come up with the idea to write this book. I must give credit uh, there to uh, the now sainted Maggie Carner who uh, did so much in the way of life ministry in the 1990s and into current century. And and um, probably along around 2004, she contacted me with um, the kind of the concept of preparing a piece that would use the chief parts of Luther's catechism as a framework or an outline uh, to address any number of particular life issues ranging uh, from uh, marriage to beginning of life and end of life issues. Those are the kind of the three big topics that we cover here. Maggie thought that we would actually prepare kind of two versions. The version that I wrote here, a small catechism on human life, and then working with uh, an educator 
do a convinced pamphlet form that could be used in confirmation class and actually inserted in the uh, cover of Luther's small catechism. And so we, we did both. As I said, this particular book, Small Catechism in Human Life, was written really at kind of an adult level, but again, with the thought that adults, adults at least in you know, our Lutheran church, have studied the small catechism as children, and Luther never intended that the catechism would be a book that you would just use for confirmation class and then set aside. In fact, Luther liked to refer to the catechism as an Enchiridion or a little handbook. And he had suggested in the preface to the small catechism that there are kind of three moves in studying the catechism. First of all, he says, you learn the text, learn the commandments, three words prayer. And then the second move is you learn what they mean. That's what Luther does in the catechism itself. He says then the third move is that after you've mastered this small catechism, take up a larger one. Luther, of course, did write a large catechism, which would fill that bill. But I have also found it helpful to think about the small catechism as a kind of a spiral staircase. You go around it first time, and again, like Luther said, you just learn the text. Second time, you learn what it means. And then the third time around, you can actually relate the text of small catechism to particular topics. For example, I did another book, a praying Luther's small catechism, looking at the catechism from the perspective of prayer. And I did a book on the small catechism as handbook for discipleship, where we examined the small catechism in light of the teaching of Christian vocation, calling. And those two books actually came after the book we're talking about this afternoon. But it was the same kind of concept here that propelled me uh, to write this earlier book, was now to take the small catechism and look at the small catechism as a way of thinking about life issues. Because now we're starting to find a way to actually apply this teaching, that this is not just kind of dogmatic data that we have downloaded into the heads of confirmands that has no connectivity to life. It really is a, a living confession, living orthodoxy uh, that reaches out to connect to every area of human life. And in our day, for reasons I think that will be obvious to uh, most of our ears, uh, these are really big issues that go to the very center of what it means to be a human creature, a human being. There is so much there where the catechism is really informing us. Uh, one of the ways I like to describe Luther's catechism is to use the language of a German theologian, Oswald Bayer, who speaks of ethic of gift. And Bayer notes in this wonderful article, this topic, uh, ethic of gift, that the Lutheran ethic first question is not, what should I do, but what have I been given? For Dr. Bayer, the takeoff point or the starting point is 1 Corinthians 4, 7 where Paul asks the rhetorical question, what do you have that you have not received? And so the catechism really narrates all the gifts that God has given, even starting with the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. There, God in his divine jealousy forbids us to have any other gods, any other entities, things, or beings that we fear, love, and trust in above him. The good news that is underneath the first commandment 
is that if you have the true God, namely Jesus Christ, you have all the God that you need. If you think about the catechism from this perspective of an ethic of gift, well, what else has God given? He's given us his name, second commandment, his word. And then you move into what we traditionally refer to as the second table of the law. He's given us parents. In fact, parents are the mass, to use Luther's language, through which God exercises his donorship of life, giving and bestowing life to us as a creator. He has given me my body. The fifth commandment protects body. And uh, the fifth commandment directs me also to help the neighbor in every bodily need, not simply to refrain from murdering the neighbor. And the sixth commandment, marriage. God wants to protect the marriage bed, this union, which he intends to be a lifelong union between one man and one woman. Or the seventh commandment, my possessions, my property, the things that I have, and how I am not to break the rhythm of God's giving and the neighbor receiving by taking that which God has not given. Steve, eighth commandment, reputation, truth teller. And ninth and tenth commandments really circle back to the first commandment, even the desires of the heart, coveting not coaching away, uh, coaching away from the neighbor, his uh, a wife or his employees or his getting his property in any underhanded or dishonest way. And then you would move into the Apostles' Creed, the self-giving of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I like to tell my ethics class, and I just shared this with them the other day, that strange as it might seem, a Lutheran ethic really begins with the words in the funeral service at the graveside when the body is about to be placed into the grave. The pastor extends his hand over the casket and says, may God, the father who created this body, may God, the son who by his blood has redeemed this body, may God, the Holy Spirit, who has sanctified this body through holy baptism, keep these remains to the resurrection of all flesh. That little piece of the middle service actually echoes the three articles of the creed. God creates, he redeems, he sanctifies. Again, all that we have in body and soul is from him. And this is really kind of a foundational point when we look at the question, what do we do with the body? Whether it is the body of the unborn, bodies of children, adults, or the bodies of those who are nearing life's end. How do we care for the neighbor in his body in light of the threefold giving of the triune God, greedily narrated. Or the Lord's Prayer. Luther places the Lord's Prayer after the creed, because if the creed narrates what the gifts of God are, the Lord's Prayer teaches us both our neediness of those gifts and what it is we are asking God to give in each of those three petitions. Baptism then comes next, and we are baptized again in the body, where our bodies are washed with water and the word and joined to the body of Christ, given a share in his death and resurrection. Baptism is then the guarantee and pledge and promise of the resurrection also of our own bodies. Uh, confession and absolution. We misuse the gifts of God. We confuse the creature for the creator. We are 
continually under the attack of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we do not always stand upright, as one of our Lenten colleagues puts it. And yet, even, you know, confronted with a sin and the way sin confuses gift and giver, God continues to be merciful and gives us the forgiveness of sins, even as we have abused uh, his gifts. And the Lord's Supper, Christ's body and blood under bread and wine given to us Christians to eat and to drink. And the forgiveness of sins that we receive in the Lord's Supper enlivens us to live in faith toward Christ and in love toward one another, as the post-communion prayer puts it in the liturgy. Again, it's bodily eating and drinking of Christ's body and blood so that our bodies are once again touched and, and sanctified, made holy by his holy body and blood. As we're reminded again in the liturgy, as the pastor dismisses the communicants, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Body does matter. Then there are two parts of the catechism that are not included in the six chief parts. They serve as a kind of appendices to the catechism. And that would be daily prayer and able of duties. If you think back to the first article of the creed and Luther's conclusion to the uh, first article, uh, after he has rehearsed what God has given me as the Father Almighty who has made me along with all creatures, given me body and soul, so forth. Then he says, for all this, it is my duty to thank, praise, serve, and obey him. But Luther doesn't go into a discussion there of 10 ways to thank and praise God or 40 days to learn how to serve and obey God. But when he runs you back, when he runs you through the rest of the catechism, he returns to that point by adding daily prayer and table of duties. Where do you thank and praise God? In the morning when you get up, in the evening when you go to bed, and at mealtime when you sit down to eat. God himself neither slumbers nor sleeps, but we as creatures cannot go without sleep. God doesn't need to be fed. He says in Psalm 50, if I were hungry, would I tell you the cattle on a thousand hills are mine, but we can't go without food and drink. And so at those very points where it is most clear that we are creatures and not the creator, we thank and praise God. And then where do we serve and obey God? Not by going into a monastery, but Luther says there are three now holy orders where the Christian lives, where the Christian exercises this duty to serve and obey God. We see that in the table of duty, where Luther arranges Bible passages around life in the congregation, where one is a preacher or hearer of the word of God, around uh, life in the uh, civic community. We would say the civil realm or citizenship, where one is either public official or a citizen, and the responsibilities tended to both ways of life there. And then finally in the household, which for Luther was not only the nuclear family of mom and dad and a few kids, but often would be also the place of daily work. Because prior to the industrial revolution, most work was done in the context of a family farm or a business that was passed down uh, from generation to generation. And often then in the household, you would have servants and sometimes a widowed grandmother or an orphaned niece living there, you know, as well. So household was really a kind of an economic uh, unit as well as familial order. Now, at any rate, the point I wanted to make here 
was that the, the catechism really does then provide this framework for understanding all that we have as a gift from God. And then the question that comes with the gift, how do you respond? How do you put it to use? That really, I think, kind of leads us up to the doorstep then of what this uh, small catechism on human life is about. If God is both giver and gift, as you write, and there is no life apart from God, how does this statement stand in stark contrast to what culture tells us about life and self-ownership and bodily autonomy? Mm -hmm. And what does this mean then for us as Christians? Yeah, I'm glad you use that word autonomy because in the conversations today, uh, that has become a big one. And autonomy stands in contradiction to this um, confession of life as life as a gift. Autonomy really comes from two Greek words, autos, self, nomos, law. Literally, a law unto yourself. We know, even apart from scripture, that human beings are not autonomous. I like to tell my students, if you think you're autonomous, just look at your belly button. You came from somebody, literally, your, your mother. You did not make yourself. If we indeed are made by God, made in the image of God, in fact, God says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that means we belong to him. Now, the sinner, unbeliever, hears that as terrifying news because the old nature doesn't want to belong to anybody. I want to be free. I want to be me in the way that I want to exist. But that really is an impossibility. The Lutheran theologian of the last century, Werner Ehlert, wrote something to the effect that autonomy remains an unfulfilled illusion, that God has actually made you, and I cannot go back and undo, for example, the time of my birth. You know, I might think it would have been really neat to have been alive, you know, in the 16th century, the time of the Reformation, but I wasn't born in the 16th century. I was born in 1953. That means my life is tied down to a particular birthday and my life on the other end will be tied down on the day of my death. And, and that what we want to emphasize, confess as Lutheran Christians, now we receive this life as a gift. We recognize that, to use the language of Paul in, in writing to the Corinthians, that we, our bodies are not our own that we've been bought with a price. And Luther picks up on that language of possession, by the way, in the second article of the Creed, where he has us uh, confess, I believe in Jesus, Jesus Christ, my Lord, who has purchased and won me, lost and condemned person, that I may be his own. In other words, this divine ownership is a good thing because he is the one who now has taken responsibility for my life. He's rescued me from sin, death, and the devil. Not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, his innocent suffering and death. And now the outcome of that is that I belong to him now in time and hereafter in eternity. So what Christian believers hear and rejoice in, celebrate as good news, Unbelievers see as a kind of oppression and tyranny that you're actually owned by another. But Christians see this not from the perspective of simply the law, but really through the lens of the gospel, which declares and confesses that all good things come to us through Jesus Christ. And that gift yes, then shapes the way that we think about every aspect of the ethic of life, from beginning of life issues to questions of vocation, 
marriage, uh, to how we care for the dying when no cure is. If we are not our own, then what does it mean for us as humans in terms of value or as some might say, intrinsic value? How do we look at ourselves and others through the lens of the gospel? Essentially, what gives us our worth and value as human Mm -hmm. creatures? And again, I think we should run that through each of the three articles of the creed. First of all, from the first article, that God has created us and he has created every human being and the dignity comes from the fact that in our creation, God has actually joined his word to matter, developing flesh and and blood. Again, I express my appreciation for the work of Oswald Bayer, and I will do so again at this juncture. He has an article entitled Self-Creation or Human Dignity? And he is actually engaging a contemporary ethicist like uh, Peter Singer, who people will know is almost kind of a household word uh, because of his kind of advocacy of a very stark uh, utilitarian ethic. Peter Singer uh, also wants to talk about dignity, human dignity. And yet for Peter Singer, dignity is something that is assigned to the human being uh, after the human being has developed a particular level of capacity. Initially for Singer, uh, that meant the embryo, the unborn, would not have human dignity uh, because they lacked particular capabilities. Later on, Peter Singer would actually uh, suggest that there could be such a thing as uh, post-birth abortion, maybe up to two years. Again, there was kind of a lacking of dignity. And so dignity comes at some point after the person has developed. Uh, Bayer instead suggests that because God's word and the element are joined at the very beginning of human life, our conception of fertilization, and that from that point on, we talk about a developing human life, but at whatever stage of the development that the human life may be in, it is still afforded dignity. That is, it is recognized as worthwhile because God himself is the creator. A buyer as a Lutheran theologian actually unpacks this to remind us that our fundamental confession of the gospel is that God justifies the ungodly by faith apart from works of the law. So just as in justification, God declares us worthy apart from what we do, going back to the first article of the creed, uh, Bayer notes that Luther uses justification language even there in confessing that God has done all of this purely out of his fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. So where the unbeliever will look at human life in terms of worth, and that worth is related to what that person might do or what that person might contribute, we narrate the gift of human life from the perspective of what God has has given. And so all human life from conception to natural death is afforded a dignity by the creator, regardless of their own faith. Even it's just as in Luther's explanation of the fourth petition in the small catechism, uh, he echoes Jesus when he says, God gives daily bread to all people, even to the evil, to the wicked without our prayer, without their prayer. So also God gives human life to all those he has created. And and so we can talk there about an intrinsic worth to human life. It is not, in other words, a worth that has to be negotiated or demonstrated. 
on the basis of other characteristics like viability or likely, you know, potential that this life is going to have to live what the world would deem to be a rich and fulfilling life. The life is sacred simply and solely because it is made by God. And it is a life that God distinguishes from other forms of biological life. And Christian theology speaks of that in terms of human, the human being being made in the image of God. Animals may share certain biological characteristics with human beings, but finally what separates man from animal is that uh, the human being, human beings, male and female, made in the image and likeness of God, Genesis 1, 26. And even though that image of God has been uh, cracked or broken by the fall, uh, in Christ it is being restored. And so, second article, Christ has died for all people, and it is the will of the Father uh, that none be lost, all come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved through faith in this Jesus, and that God has created us for the destiny of resurrection. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead, given to me and all believers in Christ eternal life. And so we rightly do battle against death, even as we recognize that uh, finally we all die. Believers have the promise that even though we die, we will have life in Christ's name uh, for eternity. We even have to pause a bit, I think, when we talk about my life. It's my life in the sense that it is a life that God has given to me. But sometimes the way we speak betray faulty assumptions. For example, one of the euphemisms that is often used for suicide, she took her own life. But if you think about it, suicide is such a terrible evil because this was a life that you're not given. You receive this life and you live this life in the care and the recognition of God's care and in the recognition that he is your God and will be with you and that you don't take your life. That runs contrary again to the giving of God. And, and that's why, you know, we, uh, try to actually stand in the way of people committing suicide because it is a, uh, way in which they are putting themselves in God's place and are not recognizing the life that they have as, as a gift from him. And that could even translate to physician assisted suicide at the end of life. Exactly. Uh, e exactly. And that, uh, one of the things that I think we're being kind of pressed to think about even more is, um, what is, uh, what is the purpose of medicine uh, for a long time? In the Western world, the practice of medicine was governed by the tradition of the Hippocratic Oath, where uh, the physician is not to be an agent of death, that uh, the physician is not to willfully do anything uh, that would, would shorten. And we've seen kind of, I think, a transformation of, of medicine here when physicians are enlisted to be agents of the will of the patient and helping them end their own lives. Again, one of the very wise Christian ethicists from the last century, who ironically enough, uh, held the chair of ethics at Princeton that is now occupied by Peter Singer, was a, um, a Christian minister by the name of Paul Ramsey. Paul Ramsey, did a lot of thinking and writing on this kind of emerging field of biomedical ethics. He did a little book, I think about 1965, entitled The Patient as Person. And at that point, he was kind of pushing back 
against what was often identified as medical paternalism. I illustrate this for my students in my ethics class by talking about the medical TV shows I watched as a kid growing up in the uh, in the 60s. Ben Casey, MD, Dr. Kildare. In those movies, uh, it was not only the age of father knows best, but the, doc, but the age of doctor knows best. The patient simply do whatever the doctor orders. And if you did what the doctor orders, Ben Casey, this kind of dashing young urban surgeon, could literally reach into the jaws of death and preserve life. But you see shifts in those medical TV shows in the 80s and 90s into 2000, you know, with General Hospital for a while, but ER, strong medicine, where you have a completely different understanding of the physician. The physician is now the one who is obligated to carry out the wishes of the patient. So I think it was uh, in strong medicine or ER, I can't remember which, uh, episode few, just a few years ago, there's an African-American man, single father, I think. Uh, his young son is in need of a heart transplant. They can't find a heart transplant. And in desperation, the father goes to the medical staff. So I want to give my own heart. No, the doctor you can't do that. That would require us to kill you. And so what does he do? In goes into the emergency room, pulls out pistol, pistol, puts it to his head, pulls the trigger, and then they harvest his heart and transplant. Well, that's you know, a perverted kind of understanding of medicine. Lutherans understand the medical profession as one of the masks of God, larvae day, that he is working through doctors and nurses as instruments of, of healing. So we do not reject medicine. We do, however, worry when medicine seeks a kind of transcendency for itself, as though now medicine or the medical profession is that profession that actually holds keys to life and death. We're really being challenged and pushed in a good way uh, to think about what is what is given to medical practice and how they are to understand themselves as as God's instrument. I mentioned Paul Ramsey. I kind of paraphrase him here, where he says uh, the physician is to aim at healing. Sometimes is given to cure, but is always to care. Uh, that's, uh, I think, a very helpful way of kind of thinking about what the physician is going to do. To aim at healing, sometimes to cure, but always to care. As one of Ramsey's students, Gilbert Mylander, who is a Missouri Senate pastor, points out that even when we cannot cure, we are always to care and never to kill. And that, again, is a quite consistent, I think, with this catechetical ethic of gift. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Luther would say that there are so many things under the realm of what we would consider to be a life issue, essentially beginning and ending of life, marriage and the family uh, as places where God guards and gives life and really all stages of life. So he really kind of expands our vision, even when he was writing in the 16th century, of what it means to be for life, pro-life, what it means to discuss and think of life issues. And aside from what we've already talked about, the unborn and also people facing death or having a terminal illness and all the way to considering ending their life, how would Luther's concepts based off scripture in the, in the small catechism translate to these emerging issues we're seeing right now about gender, identity, human sexuality, our autonomy or right to choose for ourselves what is our own identity. How does what he has in the small catechism translate to that topic? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, for Luther, 
identity is not something that you choose for yourself. Your identity is given. It is given by God in creation, who has made us male and female. Our bodies are not simply clay that we can refashion any way we want to refashion. It's not about, in other words, self-expression, but the recognition that God has made me and I know myself to be man or woman from his word, which speaks to the reality of my body empirically. In other words, uh, I am man, I'm not woman, and that is bodily reality. I think so much of what we see today is an attempt to kind of transcend the body, which is really a form of Gnosticism that says the body really doesn't matter. It's just a container for your will. And Luther recognizes that the will is actually dead in sin apart from Christ and that we don't have the power to will our salvation. We didn't have the power to will our coming into existence in the first place. In other words, life is not something that we have made for ourselves, but we receive the life we have been given. And again, all kinds of questions of spiritual care would come up, for example, with people with so-called gender dysphoria and, uh, and how the evangelical task of the church is encouraging and helping such a person recognize and receive their body as indeed the body that God has given them and that it's not an object that they can retool according to their own purposes. Or at the end of life, uh, the way unbelief kind of looks at it is your body is kind of like your toy. And as long as it's functioning, it's a, kind of a good thing. But if the toy is broken, doesn't work anymore, then you trash it. Physician assisted suicide or euthanasia. These practices simply run contrary to any kind of confession of God being the creator and the Lord of life. We need kind of preemptively, I think, and this is the reason we wanted to include some of this material here for a kind of a youth edition so that pastors can begin kind of preemptively to talk about some of these issues before they become kind of a flashpoint because a young person or not so young person has had some kind of encounter that would suggest to them that they're in the wrong body or that they can achieve a child uh, by any medical means that be possible and, and would be tempted to think again that they can live a life without any kind of limitation, a life that uh, transcends givens that we have in creation in this body. And so when, when we're tempted to despair as Christians about the wreck that sin has made and all of the human suffering that goes along with it, what do you find to be the most comforting part of the small catechism and why? Yeah, again... And I'd have to go back to the second article, which I've mentioned a little while ago. I believe in Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, uh, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, lost and condemned person, purchased and won me not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, that I may be his own, live under him in his kingdom, serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. And zeroing in particularly on that central affirmation that I may be his own. In other words, I recognize that my little life is in the hands of the Lord, in the hands of the God who created me, in the nail-scarred hands of the Son who redeemed me, and in the hands of the Holy Spirit who has made me his own in baptism. And to say that Jesus is Lord, that I belong to him, means my destiny is secure because he has been raised from the dead never to die again. My destiny is tied up with his empty tomb. And that gives us hope. And hope here is not 
optimism or wishful thinking, but hope is faith that is looking to the future because we know what God has already done. So, you know, unbelievers will talk about optimism and pessimism as kind of two different attitudes for facing the future. The Christian has a third option, and that is courage. A courage that is born of my baptism into Christ and the sure promise that he gives me in that baptism that those who have been joined to Jesus' death will also share in a resurrection like him. So I can face the future with this courage that is characterized by this. And, and that means also in terms of our vocation, we do not as Christians forsake this dying world. Lutherans don't embrace the so-called Benedict option that we're just gonna have our little kind of holy huddle and the world can kind of go to hell in a handbasket and we'll just kind of self-preserve. No, we recognize that the life God has given us is a life that is not to be self-enclosed, but turned inside out to serve the neighbor in love. And so we will continue to live, to use Jesus' language, as salt and light. Salt, which serves as a um, preserving agent in the decaying creation and light that means that we recognize the truth of him who is the light and we reflect that light and we can do that also with great joy as christians live the life of faith uh, we are not kind of pessimistic as i said or dour or um, simply nelly negatives as some people have described Christians, but we are very positive and it's a positivity based on what God has given. And so we talk about joyfully pressing this faith because the Lord that we serve is abundant and packed full of mercy, good gifts. And we want to, we do in the catechism, again, extol those gifts. Thank you for reminding us, Dr. Pless, or for at least giving us this beautiful starting point that you have in your book of the pronouncement of faith as Christians, that God is both giver and gift. From that starting point, we can move forward and, as you said, joyfully serve our neighbor, joyfully live in our baptismal life, and have courage to persevere until our natural death and with the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of our bodies. And yeah. as Dr. Martin Luther had intended for his small catechism to be a, a handbook, one that is circled back to time and time again throughout a person's life, Dr. Plus, you have provided us with an incredibly helpful handbook that I have read a at least four times through and is a quick an easy reference for um, anyone who possesses this book. And so I strongly encourage all of our listeners to find this book, receive it, and have it on your bookshelf, not only keeping it on your bookshelf, <laughs> but bringing it out often to read and to reread. And if you're wondering, listeners, where you can find this book, currently it is available on the CPH website. That is concordiapublishinghouse.org. And then in addition to the physical copy, you can also get the digital copy, uh, which is also available in Spanish and Russian, in addition to English, on our website, www.lcmslife.org. You can also find other books by Dr. Pless through our website, including a pamphlet entitled Mercy at Life's End. Dr. Pless, where can you get the other books that you mentioned you had written, Alan? Those are available from Concordia Publishing House as well. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed this, and uh, thank you for your uh, strong witness uh, to the life that we have in uh, Christ Jesus. Appreciate the time to be with you today. Thank you. And we want to thank our listeners, too, for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review and don't forget to click the follow or subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. New episodes drop twice each month. 
You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that introduces listeners to life issues by introducing them to friends who stand for life. Thank you.